All right, let's mess around a bit with the uh, center of mass and we'll see what, uh, wh what the big deal is with it. Uh, I think you're gonna appreciate this because it's going to, um, you'll see where this concept of momentum came from that you worked on uh, freshman year. Um, so what we've got going on here is just kind of freshman year type pro issue situation where you have a 50 kilogram cart rolling along and then this cart's just sitting there and it's, you know, they're gonna collide um, and then we'll look at how it kind of moves after. Well, the first thing we're being asked to do is it says find the center of mass at the instant shown in the picture above. Well, so we want to get the center of mass here. And so the idea is that, well, position zero, um, that's worth 50 kilos. And position 100, um, that's actually worth 100 kilos. And then you got to divide by the total mass, which is going to be 150. Um, and so what you get is, well, 100 over 150 is two thirds. So you get two thirds of 100. Um, so you get like 66.7 meters. So the center of mass is two thirds of the way over. Um, so at this instant, it's gonna be like right in here, that's your center of mass. Um, and again, it kind of makes sense that it's twice as close to this as it is to that. Um, so there's the center of mass like right at this instant, if you took a picture. Um, then it says to find it as a function of time, right? Well, this thing is gonna move, right? So as the 50 kilogram thing moves, um, this thing is gonna continue to move um, also um, as this thing travels to the right. So let's, we can get that. We can use the same approach, really. It's just that instead of calling the position of this thing zero, we'll, we'll say that it's on the move. In fact, the position of this thing is gonna be 20t because it's going a speed of 20. Um, so what we can do is we can say, well, the position of the center of mass is going to be, again, instead of position zero, the position of this 50 kilogram cart is actually 20t. So it's a time dependent position, 20t. So the position 20t, that's worth 50. Um, and position 100 is still worth 100 uh, as it was up above. Um, and so then what we can do is, well, we still got to divide by the total mass, divide by 150. Uh, so like looks like we get um, well 50 over 150 is is um, a third um, So we get looks like we get 20 over 3 times T um, plus the 66.7 Okay, so there's the position of the center of mass right so So that thing the position of the center of mass is time dependent, right? Um, it says find the velocity of that center of mass. So that center of mass is gonna just keep drifting to the right. Um, well, to find the velocity, um, you know, you can find the slope of the position function. So the slope of 20t, uh, 20t over three plus 66.7 is just 20 over three. Um, so the velocity is 20 over three, say meters per second, which you can find by taking the derivative of that, um, right? Um, by the way, that should make some sense because notice that when this thing moves um, 100 meters, this thing only has to move one third of that as, as this covers that 100 meters as the 50 kilogram cart. So the center of mass here is just drifting over um, at 20 over three uh, meters per second. Okay, so it's just, you just think of it being on the move um, to, the, to the right. Um, Final comment, I guess, on this page is another easy way to get the velocity of center of mass is, is very similar to um, how you found the position of the center of mass itself. What you can do is you can say, well, the velocity of 20, that's worth 50, because the 50 kilogram cart was going 20. Um, so the, the velocity of 20 is worth 50. The velocity of zero is worth 100, because the, um, the 100 kilogram uh, cart was sitting still and then what you got to do is then divide by 150 and what you notice is well this part gives you zero and so you get 50 over 150 which is a third times 20 so again you get 20 over 3 um, meters per second so that center of mass is just drifting along at one third of the speed of this cart okay um, now looking ahead um, I'm just going to kind of blast ahead with something here. When these two things hit each other, okay, the, 
the 100 kilogram cart is going to start to roll to the right well because it felt a force from the 50 kilogram cart and the 50 kilogram cart well it can't keep going 20 it's going to have to slow down because the 100 it's going to hit the 100 kilogram cart so that so that's got to change its speed so this thing will feel a force its motion will change this thing will feel a force its motion will change now what's neat to think about is the system as a whole which is both of these carts on the system as a whole there's no horizontal forces well, if there's, um, in, the only horizontal forces are internal to the system, like this cart puts a force on this one, and this one puts a force back on that one. But on the entire system, there's nothing happening sideways. Well, so what that means is if there's no net force on the whole system, the center of mass can't change its speed. Because if you do F equals MA on the whole system, the system shouldn't have any acceleration. So what that means is after the crash, even after the crash, the center of mass of the system needs to maintain that speed. Okay. Well, you've, you've done problems like this freshman year, where what you did freshman year was, was you said, well, there's this idea or something that's called momentum. And you'd say P before is P after momentum being mass times velocity and what you did in in freshman years you said well I have a 50 kilogram thing going 20 meter per second that's all the momentum present in the system before and then after the crash um, assuming these things stick together let's say just to make life easy on us assuming they stick together you'd have a hundred and fifty kilogram thing going some mystery velocity right because they'll, they'll hit and then smack and then kind of drift over well, what you notice is if you solve for the V final, it's going to be 50 over 150 times 20, or it's going to be 20 over 3. So if these things were to hit and stick, they would continue then to drift at 20 over 3 meters per second, which is exactly how fast the center of mass was going before the crash. Um, so the thing to bear in mind with, with any collision, and it turns out this is incredibly useful, is... You have the center of mass of the system doing whatever it's doing before a crash. If there's a crash and the only forces on the system are, are between pieces of the system, the center of mass will not change how it moves. Okay? And a little bit of a spoiler alert is um, even if these carts did not stick and we'll do problems where they don't stick, where they bounce off each other and stuff, the center of mass of the system will have to continue no matter what at the um, 20 over 3 uh, meters per second, again, as long as the only forces in the system are between objects. Um, so kind of a nice little consequence of really just Newton's law, saying if there's no net force, then there can be no net acceleration of the system, even though each individual object does experience an acceleration. So if you go on the next page, just continuing along with that example, um, and maybe up here in the margin, I'll draw what was going on um, before. So right before the crash, we had the 50 kilo deal. The cart was going um, 20 meter per second. And the 100 kilo cart was just sitting still. So that's what was going on um, before. And then we'll say now instead of them hitting and sticking together, um, let's say that the it just so happens that the 50 kilogram cart after the crash bounces backward four meter per second. Okay, say that happens. Um, now, as I was mentioning before, it says, well, since there's no external force sideways on the entire system, the only forces are one cart on another and the equal and opposite force, um, you know, from, from the other, from the second cart on the first, um, the, the velocity of the center of mass should not change. Well, so what we can do then is we can say, well, the velocity of the center of mass should still be 20 over 3, Okay, because it was 20 over 3 up here. Well, let's see what that tells us about the aftermath of the crash. Well, so what we have is a velocity of negative 4, that's worth 50, and a velocity of, well, V final for the 100 kilogram cart, um, that is worth 100, uh, and then again divided by 150. Um, so we have to do this... Um, this a little bit of math. Um, so let's see, it looks like we have 20 thirds equals negative, well 50 over 150 would be a third, so that would be like negative 4 thirds would be this term, and then this term would be um, 2 thirds of VF, uh, so plus 2 thirds VF, 
Um, and so if you bring the four thirds over, you'd get 24 over three, which is eight. Um, so the next line of algebra, I don't have room underneath, so I'm gonna do it over here. You'd have, bringing the four thirds over, you get eight, 24 over three. Um, eight equals two thirds VF. So basically VF then needs to be 12 um, uh, meter per second for the 100 kilogram cart. Okay, so this thing needs to fly away. Apparently, um, this thing ended up being 12, right? Now, if you had done the same exact problem freshman year, what you would have done is said, you, you know, it says here, use momentum. What you've done is you just said, well, P before, the momentum before is the momentum after. P before is P after. Before the crash, I have a 50 kilogram thing going 20 meters per second. Um, this thing is doing nothing, so there's, it doesn't contribute to the momentum before. Equals, and then you'd say I have a 50 kilogram thing going negative four after the crash, plus a 100 kilogram thing going some mystery speed. That's how you'd have set this up freshman year. So it looks like we get 100 equals negative, um, that's not 100, that's 1,000. 1,000 equals um, negative 200 plus 100 VF. So you get 1,200 equals 100 VF. So therefore, VF equals 12. So, um, so you, get, you, know, you get the same answer um, from this thing, right? So um, you notice that we get the same answer by saying that the center of mass, the velocity at the center of mass doesn't change. Um, uh, as we get using momentum. Well, that's no accident, okay? If you skip up to 182, just to show you a, a little connection here. So all we're doing here is saying that if, if you have a crash and the only forces are between objects, that the, the velocity of the center of mass before has to be equal to the velocity of the center of mass after, okay? Well, let's write down how you write the velocity of the center of mass. You take, you know, each velocity times how much mass it's worth. Um, you sum those all up and then divide by total mass. You do that before. That's the velocity center mass before. And then you do the same thing after. Well, what you notice is the denominators of both of these are just the total mass. Well, so that should basically slash out on both sides. Okay. And so what you find is then the numerators are equal. Well, all this says is that the MVs before equal the MVs after. Oh, the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. So it just drops in your lap after saying that the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change in a collision. Okay. So to go back to the problem that we were looking at just now, when this cart comes in, you've got this center of mass here trickling along at 20 over 3 um, meters per second. After the crash, even though these things bounced apart, that center of mass needs to continue to just drift through space. This like imaginary point just continues moving um, as though nothing ever happened. So it's really useful um, thing. Um, so you can either you know figure this thing out kind of by thinking of the center of mass, or really what it does is it derives this idea that all the MVs before equal the MVs after. Okay. Um, final comment here, just to finish this page, it says, well, was kinetic energy conserved in the collision? Okay, well, if you remember, um, Ke, the kinetic energy in general of an object is one half mv squared. Um, we'll derive that later in, um, in this class. But let's just check that for the system. So we can say Ke before, well, that's the only thing that had Ke before was uh, this 50 kilogram cart. So you'd say, well, one half of a 50 kilogram cart that's doing uh, 20 meters per second, and then we got to square it. Um, so it looks like, let's see, this would be um, uh, 400, half of 400 is 200. Um, so what do we got, 10,000 joules before? Right, 20, 25, 25 times 400? Yeah, so 10,000 joules. That's the total energy before. If we get the energy after, Ke after, well, we have two objects on the move. Um, whoops, let me zoom this down. You have two objects on the move after. You have a 50 kilogram thing going four meters per second. Um, so let's take care of that. So, so you have one half of a 50 kilogram thing going four meters per second. Notice the sign doesn't matter because you're squaring it and, and kinetic energy doesn't have a direction anyway. Um, plus, 
And then the other thing that has energy is this 100 kilogram thing going 12. So we have to say 1 half of 100 times 12 squared. Uh, so let's see, 16, 4 times 4 is 16, divide by 2, 8, 8 times 5, 40. So if there's 400 joules that are in that cart, the cart kind of went back to the left. And then this is what, 144, um, 144 times 50, um, which will get you 7,200. So it looks like there's 7,600 joules. So take home point. Before the crash, there was a certain amount of energy. Uh, the thing was, this guy was coming in carrying 10,000 joules. There's a crash. Well, you would hear it when they hit each other, right? It would make noise. Well, that's energy leaving the system. So in general, this is the key point for this section of material is when you have a crash, it's not the energy before that's going to be equal to energy after as far as the, the kinetic energy anyway, because some energy is going to leak away in the form of like sound and heat. Um, that we that's very difficult to keep track of okay um so it's it's not that the energy before equals the energy after in a collision what's going to be the case is that the mvs before the momentum before is going to be equal to the momentum after so in a crash the thing that you get to hang your hat on is the momentum so this guy p before is p after that you're going to you're going to be able to use that in a crash um, or we'll see an explosion collision or explosion what won't happen is the um, kinetic energy in general will not be conserved, right? Um, so key point with collisions, conserve the momentum. In general, the, the energy, um, at least the kinetic energy, the particles, will not be conserved.